Good morning, and welcome back to Global Neurosciences Institute Grand Rounds. Um, and now, with, with great pleasure, uh, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Olga Thon. Dr. Olga Thon received medical degree from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. She completed neurology residency at Harvard, Massachusetts General Brigham and Women's Hospital. This, this was followed by neuro uh, ophthalmology fellowship at Massachusetts um, uh, Eye and Ear Infirmary and Neuroimmunology and Multiple Sclerosis Fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital. Currently, Dr. Thone is an assistant professor at neurolo uh, of neurology at Cooper Medical School of Provence University, and she also serves as an associate program director of neurology residency at Cooper. Uh, Dr. Thone has special interests in multiple sclerosis and neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. And today, Dr. Thone will be speaking about neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorders. Dr. Thone, it is great pleasure seeing you again. Hi, very nice to see you again. Uh, it kind of feels like coming back home. Uh, <laughs> sorry about the aggressiveness of the sun uh, rising this morning. It looks morning. beautiful. It looks beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's not painful to look directly at me. I'm going to keep the same position. I was trying to fit all the where am I going to sit here, but I, th I think this is kind of okay at this point. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, super happy to be here uh, because it's a webinar. I can't see your faces, but uh, I'm assuming some friendly faces uh, out there as well. Uh, I, I know people can't answer, but hi, Jill. Like <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to go, go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, to you guys about neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders, and there has been so many changes, I would say, especially since 2015, uh, then even more recently with the, you know, complete change in how we treat this disorder, that I think this, uh, this has probably be become one of my most relevant talks. Uh, so let me just move the cameras towards this side, one second. Just so it's not right in front of me. There we go. Perfect. So those are my disclosures. So back in 2019, when uh, the AAN was in uh, was in Philadelphia, we had uh, Natalia Roast, uh, who was the president of the research section of the AAN. Uh, uh, pretty much put uh, a spot within neuromyelitis optica. She mentioned within her introduction speech that the holy grail of science is to be able to identify the basic pathology that underlies disease. And this is exactly what had recently happened with neuromyelitis optica. So let's backtrack ourselves a little bit more. And what is this disorder, right? Every time I'm talking to either medical students or residents, uh, there are several questions that we usually ask, especially in neurology, but in medicine in general. But to start trying to understand what has happened with this disorder, let's just focus on what is it. So first, it's an inflammatory CNS disorder that is distinct from multiple sclerosis. That's not very hard to figure out, right? I gave it a different title. I'm not here to talk about MS. And if we were to name it today, we would probably use something like autoimmune aquaporin-4 channelopathy, which is the actual mechanism of the disorder. Uh, where does it usually happen within the, the central nervous system? So the, the, there are certain areas of predilection, and those areas continue to be the optic nerves, the spinal cord, and the air postrema. And I'm going to give much more details about that in just a few minutes, but this is just to kind of like get the ground running and get all of us within the same page of what is this disease. And how does it happen? It's a recurrent disorder. We know that the majority of those patients are going to have attack over attack over attack, which changes how we're going to think through this entire lecture about thinking of the importance of how aggressive do we need to be and how early do we need to start thinking about putting these patients on a prevention, on something that is going to prevent them from having that second very likely disabling attack. And the, you've all heard both neuromyelitis optica and neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. Uh, so the term actually uh, came, came in, in, into picture in the first place back in 2015 from the last update, which is now, you know, it, it needs to be updated again. But uh, it was mostly to actually include the patients that had neuromyelitis optica disorder, uh, that had the antibody, the aquaporin-4 antibody, but did not have the full presentation of the disease. And that's not really how we necessarily use it today. So it was first described back in 1894 by Davik, uh, 
And back then, you know, the a neurologist used to be a renaissance man, someone that would not just see their patients in clinic, but then would go ahead and be uh, part of the pathology, right? Would be present during the autopsy of those patients, trying to understand what has happened to them. Uh, and then even back then, and I'm not going to try to to put anyone through the pain of watching my non-existing French, but back then he already noted that there was myelitis as well as involvement of the optic nerve uh, in those patients. But was it really DEVEX? So he had a student uh, who was doing his thesis. I'm assuming at this point he would have been his fellow, right? Uh, who was uh, Fernand Gott. And uh, he had actually presented about the same patient the year before that he had described uh, that a few months before he was able to describe this patient uh, back in 1894. And uh, so to this day, it continues to be a little bit of a dispute. Uh, I would say probably a joint effort, but I'm not here to, to necessarily put my foot down on something like that. Uh, so what was that big change that Natalia Rose was talking about? So the aquaporin-4 antibody was first discovered, was first described back in 2004 by Lennon and his colleagues. And they, they, they reported the neuromyelitis optica uh, antibody back in the, in the brain and kidneys of mice. Uh, so it's an antibody against a channel that we see both in the brain as well as in the, as well as in the kidney because it has to do, to do with the flow of water inside and outside of the cells. Uh, that will have to do with the mechanism of the disease, which is when those antibodies are targeted, uh, it, are targeting those, those channels, and then they can no longer function perfectly. What happens is that a, the cell loses a lot of water, and then it nat naturally goes into apoptosis, and then you have, obviously, cell death. Uh, initially, the antibody wasn't so great. It had a very high specificity. Uh, and, the, you know, the beginnings, we, we used to use just the ELISA method uh, to, 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 to try to find it within the samples of our patients. And despite the high specificity, it was a very low sensitivity. And then very quickly, uh, in 2015, we started having antibodies, uh, antibody assays that were still had a high specificity of 95%, but still with a sensitivity ranging around 73%. Uh, and then as in 2019 and some of those more still use more recent, um, more recent assays that are cell-based assays, they have a specificity that even ranges up to, uh, to 95%, uh, depending on where you're sending uh, those cell-based assays uh, uh, to. Uh, the goal is if you want to increase the sensitivity and the specificity, uh, usually what the labs are going to do when they have, let's say, a discrepant result is that they're going to do more than one method. So they're going to do immunofluorescence combined with cell-based assay, for example. And how, how does the disease happen? So, you know, there's those antibodies. Where do they come from? So this is a very nice diagram by, uh, by Sean Pietak uh, that was published back in 2016. And are you as lost as I am? Uh, so this is what I do every day. And oh my goodness, this is, you know, I don't even know where to start. So let's try to make this a little bit easier for all of us. So here's the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and you can see an astrocyte. It's living its life. It's very happy. It's sending some messages. It's surrounded by myelin. And in green, you can see the oligodendrocyte that, uh, that is right there. And then what I wrote as BBB is the blood-brain barrier. So now what we're going to see is a lymphocyte. And it just so happens to be a T lymphocyte that for the purpose of this lecture, I decided that it was going to come first. And then once that T lymphocyte decides, this, decides to cross the blood-brain barrier for whatever reason, it's going to start secreting some stuff. What is this? It's usually cytokines like TNF-alpha and interleukin, uh, like interleukin-6. And it does that because the T lymphocyte doesn't like to be alone. It has a lot of fear of missing out and it wants to recruit some friends. So let's say that now a B cell is going to come in answering the message, that the very aggressive text message that was sent by the T lymphocyte. And then once it joins the party, if this patient ends up having multiple sclerosis, there's going to be some antibodies. And for multiple sclerosis, we may not have an antibody, but we know that the primary target is the myelin. And because it's going to attack the myelin, you're going to see demyelination. And obviously, we're not fools, right? We know that obviously the actual brain cells are going to be affected as well. And in the vast majority of those patients, we're able to find that there is uh, a lot of cell bath of the astrocytes if, if, if we do autopsies uh, later on. But we're here to talk about neuromyelitis optica. So just refocusing myself, uh, now those antibodies, they're going to decide to target uh, 
the the aquaporin for antibodies. And I got this nice the, the nice little diagram of the channel straight up from Wikipedia. Believe it or not, it was actually the best uh, picture that I could find of it. Uh, so go Wikipedia. And now those antibodies are going to target the podocytes of the astrocytes where those antibodies are. And then this is what they cause. A lot of cell death, a lot of shenanigans. And because it's an astrocytopathy, we're usually going, we're usually going to see that the actual cell death mostly where you see the gray matter, right? Mostly where you're going to see a lot of the actual cell bodies living. So you see that within right the center of the age. Sorry, I'm trying to, oh, can you guys see when I'm moving my cursor? I don't think so. Um, in any case, uh, so if you go to picture A, you can see that it's right in the center of the spinal cord, right? So you're getting right that center of that H. Uh, and it's surrounding the spinal canal, right in the center of the spinal cord, where you have the higher amount of those channels leaving. And then this is what happened. If you just look straight to the right to picture C and D, you can see a lot of uh, necrosis and infiltration of both neutrophils and eosinophils. Uh, and then on E, you can see immunoreactivity for the aquaporin 4 antibody. And uh, there's a lot of complement that gets activated. So you can see perivascular on F and G, you can see perivascular complement activation as well as part of the apoptosis process that is going to happen to those astrocytes. So how, how do we determine that someone has, so now that we understand a little bit more of what this disease is, how do we determine that someone has this disorder? Um, so in 1999, we had the first diagnostic criteria. And it's, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you know at this point that this is not going to be what we have those days, right? So back then they were very strict. For someone to be able to be diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica, they had to have a combination of optic neuritis, acute myelitis, and nothing else in their brain. So no other symptoms or MRI brain uh, imaging involvement of anything else within the brain. So very strict. And then in 2006, we became a little bit more laxed we understood that uh, actually a lot of those patients do have those lesions in the brain that we don't really know what to call. We don't really know what to make out of those, but they do exist. So let's relax the clinical uh, requirements so that we can include people in this diagnosis. And then remember that back in 2004, Lennon had described that antibody. So 2006, that was already out there. So whoopsie daisies, let's quickly modify this. And then in 2007, there was again another diagnostic criteria that was basically just including the aquaporin 4 antibody as part of the criteria. Uh, and it, the, the, the term neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders wasn't there yet. So a lot of us were still a little confused. And I think most of the confusion was really arising from people that, you know, yeah, you had optic neuritis, there's a new antibody out there, let's just test you. And then, whoa, you actually have this antibody being positive. Now, what do we do with you? Because that criteria from 2006 and 2007 says very clearly that you have to have many of those things happening at the same time. So, so how do we manage this? So then in 2015, we have what is now the most recent uh, updated criteria for the diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica, which basically divides those patients into two very clear groups the neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders with the aquaporin-4 antibody positive and the ones with the negative antibody. So aquaporin-4 positive, it's kind of straightforward, right? We know you have neuromyelitis optica. So all you have to do is have one core clinical characteristic. So those core clinical characteristics are going to be, again, the lesion of the eriplostrema, the optic neuritis and the transverse myelitis, and I'll show much better images in just a second. But now let's just take another moment to talk about those patients that we still, we're still not so sure how to include, because now that a lot of those patients have the aquaporin and uh, aquaporin 4 antibody positive, and I can tell you that it's about 70% of the populations that arise from center to center, but the majority of places in the United States, that's what we see. Uh, so for those patients that don't have and don't happen to have the antibody, they must have at least two core clinical characteristics, and they have to follow some norms, which we'll talk about in a second again. And you have to exclude other alternative diagnosis. So how do we do that? So let's talk about the core clinical character characteristics. How do I convince myself that this patient that has a negative antibody he still has NMO. How do I put my foot down that this is what's going on? So at least two of those core clinical characteristics. And there's actually six of them, but at least one needs to be the main ones, needs to be the most relevant that are highlighted in orange here. So let's talk about optic neuritis first. 
So you all heard the term longitudinally extensive, usually referring to transverse myelitis. For the optic nerves, I'm looking for the same exact thing. I want lesions that are going to get at least half of the length of the optic nerve. And very often, those lesions are actually involving the chiasm, if not crossing to the other optic nerve. So this is a little bit of how this is going to look like. Those are some very good examples. And most of those pictures I'm going to be showing, they're, they're either from other papers, patients of mine, but the vast majority, they come straight out of the 2015 initial paper. So here you can see all the way to the left, the T2 hyperintensity um, within, uh, within the, the left optic nerve uh, that is being pointed by the arrow. And then you can see on the middle section on, the, on this coronal image that there is, uh, when you look at the optic nerve within, in this coronal section, that it's bright, right? So if you pay attention, I don't have my cursor, but if you pay attention to the intensity of the gray matter just above it, right? Right up there in the, in the, in the frontal lobes of the brain, you can see that the, the gray matter is bright, meaning that white matter right above it is dark. So this is the color that I'm expecting for the optic nerve because it's very high, heavily myelinated, right? So look how bright it is. It looks just like gray matter. It shouldn't do that. And, when you, and then when you look all the way to the right, the arrows are pointing those lesions that are really chiasmal, that are really all the way to the back of the optic nerve. So this is usually what I'm looking for. What is, how about the spinal cord? Well, the spinal cord, you've heard the usual, at least two and a half or three segments of the, of, of the spinal cord. And I'm really gonna try to be seeing very often that there is expansion, that there's tumefaction of that spinal cord when the disease actually happens. Imagine how inflammatory that is if there's necrosis, cell death, right? How much edema I'm expecting to see. And later on, I'm gonna start seeing atrophy. So very often those patients that have a very thin uh, section of the spinal cord. So that's gonna look kind of like that. So if you look all the way to the left on A, you can see how long this lesion is and it's going from the top arrow all the way to the bottom of the cervical spine and really extending through most of the thoracic spine. And this is extreme, but actually very often is what we see in those patients. And then if you look to B and C, you can see both the T2 hyperintensity as well as the T1 post -constrict contrast enhancement that is happening right in the center of the cord, right? And then now if you look at D, you can again see that hyperintensity. And what I'm gonna call out at D is an area of predilection for the aquaporin-4 antibodies, which is all the way to the top at the junction between the medulla, the bottom of the brain with the cervical spine. So those cervical medullary junctions, they are, mwah, that's really a place where those antibodies like to go to. And then you can see a very similar thing on E. And then what's usually going to happen chronically is that you start seeing either uh, a syrinx, right? So a space that is dead, that now there used to be cord, and now it has been filled up by fluid because something must occupy the space. And then on G, you can see how thin that spinal cord is. Uh, that fairly often will happen after those patients have those longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. How about the aeropostrema? So that's the belly of the fourth ventricle. That's the very front area that is expanding all the way from the pons, all the way down to the medulla. And very often those patients are going to have gastrointestinal side effects, nausea, vomiting, the classic incontrollable hiccups. Uh, and then for brainstem imaging, so not just the aeropostrema, but other areas within the brainstem, usually what you're going to see is this. So here on A, you can see the highlighted area of the, uh, of the, of the belly of the fourth ventricle uh, all the way down to the medulla, and then very similar lesions on B and C. And then you can see, um, you can see uh, axial sections of very similar lesions, again, either through the medulla or through the pons on D, E, and F. And on H, you can see something that is also very classic of neuromyelitis optica. Because those channels like to be close to where there's fluid, it wouldn't be surprising that they're lining the ventricles, right? So what you see is this, look on H, how neatly that hyperintensity is kind of like surrounding the ventricle, right? It's kind of like getting like the entire border of it. Does that look like multiple sclerosis to you? It doesn't, right? It's not the 90 degree perpendicular lesions that are running away from the ventricles. No, this one is hugging the ventricle. It's all over it. That's what it likes to do. And how about a few other things? So those are the main core clinical characteristics, but we still have a few other syndromes that can happen with this disorder, right? So here are some of the diencephalic and cerebral lesions, and you can see that they can look like anything, but do they look like MS? They don't. It's not those ill-defined, uh, 
almost perpendicular lesions, right, that are usually running away from the ventricles or just a cortical or cortical, but that you see that they follow the path usually of a blood vessel. Those lesions, no, they, they just do whatever they want. Uh, they look uh, atypical for the demyelinating lesions of multiple sclerosis. And I'll call your attention uh, for a few things that can happen. So on A and B, you're seeing either the thalamic or the diencephalic lesions, and you, you, can, you can tell that those lesions, they are usually contiguous. So sometimes they're going to be coming surprisingly all the way down from the brainstem and then kind of like continue creeping all the way up to the brain. And then on E, there's again, periventricular lesion, but that is hugging the ventricle that is kind of expanding all the way through it. And then on F, a much better example of one of those lesions that, that I was mentioning, contiguous, that is coming all the way down. You can see it at the pons and then passing through the thalami and then making its way all the way up uh, to, to the more subcortical areas. So what else have you learned about this disorder? So it's not that we were dum-dums, it's just that, well, we're observing things we're learning, right? So things that were previously excluded that we didn't understand that were part of this disorder, that we have surprisingly learned much more with, with the addition of the antibody because now we're paying attention to these people that before we were probably just have chucked up to a very aggressive course of multiple sclerosis. So it can have a relapsing course. And actually, because those, those events, let's call it events for the time being, are so much more intense, we usually use the term attack to describe them rather than a relapse. There can be a long interval between two index events. And it's okay if it's not horrendous. Sometimes those patients might have just mild or para or tetraparesis. It doesn't, it doesn't have that they become paraplegic or tetraplegic. You can have an incomplete myelitis. You can have just unilateral optic neuritis. It doesn't have to be bilateral. The majority of people don't have bilateral optic neuritis at the same time. And you can have concomitant disorders, just like the antibody doesn't like to be alone at the brain. It also doesn't like to come alone as an autoimmune disorder. So it really enjoys coming in with either myasthenia gravis, lupus, or Sjogren's. Those are kind of like some favorites that will usually happen so much that usually when I see those patients that come in with NMO first, I will actually start sending antibodies just to try to be ahead of the curve and figure out if they need a little bit more attention, which will usually help me figure out which medication is better for them. So let's talk about a case. So first, we're going to talk about a 38-year-old African-American woman with a history of lupus that came in with a headaches that were followed by left hemiplegia, dysarthria, and a very weak neck flexion. We imaged her in Wowza. Look at that longitudinally extensive uh, T2 hyperintensity. You can see that across multiple sections. And again, the, the theme here is that it's surrounding the spinal canal, right? So different than those lesions from multiple sclerosis that are much more often lateral, that are gonna get almost like that Dawson finger that we see in the surrounding the ventricles, we see that in the spinal cord, like a thumbnail imprint. That's what I, why I'm you know, doing this, this weird motion here in front of you with the camera. Uh, and then with the pre and post contrast, you can see that there was uh, some contrast enhancement and look at how close it is to the, to the junction of the medulla, right? Uh, and then at the brain, uh, she had this additional lesion within the pons. Uh, again, not really MS looking, right? It's not your usual like Dawson finger looking lesion. Um, it's just a little bit more atypical for, for demyelination. So I also call your attention to what was not there. So this is another image of her brain. You can see that she doesn't have any of those periventricular uh, running away from the ventricle kind of lesions. So uh, she eventually got diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica. And what I'll call your attention for this case is that she has, uh, it, usually for those patients, we expect that they will have a second attack. So what we do with this woman, if I know that there's a very, very high chance, 90% chance that she will have a second attack and 60% of those are within the first year, I got to hurry, right? Only 10% of those patients don't have a second attack but I don't have a crystal ball yet. I don't have a good biomarker to tell me what are the patients that are going to do better versus the patients that are going to do worse. Uh, and then again, looking for that systemic autoimmunity, right? The, the conjunction with other autoimmune disorders to kind of even make it more likely that you're going to be thinking of neuromyelitis optica. So who are these people? Where are they? So the prevalence ranges anywhere from 0 0.5 to 10 in 100,000. And just so you have a little bit of an idea for comparison of how rare this means, uh, for multiple sclerosis, we usually range anywhere from 100 to 100 per 100,000, uh, depending where you are. Obviously, with multiple sclerosis, we all know that there is that predilection for the areas that are away from the tropics, right? 
probably something to do with the vitamin D exposure and sun exposure, but, uh, but for this disorder, there is a few other predilections. It mostly tend to happen uh, on black patients and that there's a little bit of a distribution that is more within East Asians and uh, not just that, but uh, typically within not just the Asians, but also the black patients, depending on, on where uh, that migration has happened. So it's much easier to understand this with looking at this world map. So if you, I know it's a whole lot of numbers, but just look at how much higher the numbers. And again, sorry, I don't have the, the curses, but, but if I did, I would be pointing out to you that all the way to the left. So in certain islands within the Caribbean, you can see that the, the, uh, that the, Prevalence goes all the way up to 10 and 100,000, like in, in the French Martinique Island uh, and in uh, other places like Brazil and Argentina, there's also a higher amount uh, of patients that, that have it. And then also within Japan and a few other areas. Uh, and then here is a different type of graph. So here, what you're seeing is... Um, the percentage of patients that are newly diagnosed with what we call an inflammatory demyelinating disease. And I know, I know NMO is not really demyelinating, but for the purposes of this paper, let's call it CNS inflammatory disorder. It would have probably been a better name. You can see the higher proportion of some of those patients in certain areas of Brazil, for example. Uh, and that really has to do with the, 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 the characteristics of that population within each one of those areas. Uh, so especially in the Southeast of Brazil. Uh, in the north. So those patients are usually in their late 30s or early 40s. Um, they're usually women. And they're very often going to present first with optic neuritis. So what are some red flags now knowing this, this, this epidemiology about the disease? So I told you a lot about attacks. If you see one of those patients that the demographics looks just like that, they come in with optic neuritis, but they start to slowly worsen, NMO doesn't do that. Uh, also, that the time of the attack, and this is not just for neuromyelitis optica, but for anyone that is coming in with a new inflammatory disorder, this is not, this is not vascular, right? So I don't expect the symptoms to reach its peak, to reach its nadir in, in less than four hours, in less than an hour even, right? So that when those things happen, please is to keep in mind other things uh, that might be like, for example, vascular. The presence of CSF, uh, oligoclonobents, we talk a, a lot about those for, uh, for multiple sclerosis. Have you heard me say anything about it so far? Not really, right? That's because very often we don't see the oligoclonobents uh, within the CSF. And it's about the opposite. So in multiple sclerosis, we see that depending on the population in 80 to 90% of patients. But within neuromyelitis optica, it's really 10 to 20% of those patients. And also red flag, obviously, if they have a concomitant history of other systemic disorders that can cause lesions that look just like that, like cancer, sarcoidosis, right? That is the, 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 our best mimicker, uh, one of our best mimickers in terms of the inflammatory disorders, as well as certain chronic infections such as HIV, syphilis, or tuberculosis, depending on, on where the patient is coming from, that can very often cause some of those longitudinally extensive lesions as well. Uh, but do we always exclude those things? They're a red flag. They're not there to completely blind you, right? So let's talk about this other woman was a 29-year-old Caucasian woman who came in with intractable nausea and hiccups. She had a head CT that was normal for the brain, but incidentally noted some cervical lymphadenopathy. And then unfortunately, she went on to being diagnosed with a breast cancer with pretty extensive lymphadenopathy. Uh, she got discharged with follow-up with oncology, but then she came right back to the emergency room just a few days later with fever, drowsiness, um, and then she was also found to have uh, intractable hiccups uh, again with the just like the, the the first time that she presented to the ED. She had an MRI brain that was again reported as normal, uh, and then she had a PET and a whole lot of a workup. So this is her brain MRI, and I'm showing you the T, uh, T1 pre and post contrast images first for you to see that there's no, uh, no contrast enhancement. 
And then this is the T2 flare. And I have to say, the most I look at those images, now I actually start seeing something. Uh, but uh, the, for, for the purposes of, let's say, radiology red, those is normal. And let's say that I'm not seeing any kind of hyperintensity. But uh, but uh, that, that, again, the most I look at those, I, I do start seeing on the middle top image that there's a little bit of brightness within the medulla. But uh, let's pretend that that did not happen. And then when she had a PET scan, she actually had all of that light up. Uh, so really showing uh, that there was FDG activity, right? That there was a uh, there was a lot of a, a lot of something happening within that area of the medulla. A lot of metabolism that usually tells you that there's cancer or that there's inflammation or sometimes infections happening in there. And then she went on to have, uh, the, as I mentioned, a lot of perineoplastic and autoimmune antibodies. And then one of those was actually the aquaporin-4. So in the cancer here, at the same time that she got diagnosed with the cancer, she also got diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica as a perineoplastic syndrome. So those things can happen. So don't completely exclude those out of your radar. So that leads us to a differential diagnosis of, let's say, the most common thing that you're going to see within those three core clinical criteria, uh, which is, let's say, the longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. We talked about MS and how those lesions are different, right? They Lesions in MS, they are, they're short. They're that thumbnail print, right? whatever they are, they, they don't look like usually more than, than, than a half segment of a vertebral body or more than one uh, MOG. Uh, which we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about in just a second. Other uh, systemic inflammatory disorders with, I would say, sarcoidosis being the main one that I keep in the differential when I see those patients with longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. Uh, Duro AV fistula, and again, when I mentioned the nadir, right, that like how, 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 how long did it take for those patients to reach the highest intensity of symptoms if it was just an hour or two hours? Please think vascular. Uh, don't let that, 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 that bias of having just seen this lecture dissuade you from the correct diagnosis. Uh, and then a few, you know, uh, uh, AV fistula, uh, intertical tumors, uh, which very often are gonna look just like that. And that's why whenever there's a doubt, right? Remember from the, uh, from the exclusion criteria, you have to make sure that there's no other inflammatory disorder. So obviously I would send uh, a, a high volume spinal tap for cytology of those patients. And when in doubt, I would add uh, a CT of the chest, abdomen and pelvis and a spectroscopy as well. Uh, B12 deficiency, which really doesn't look that much like it, right? It's more posterior columns, uh, but you know, because it's longitudinally extensive, it, it's very natural that you might be thinking of that and it doesn't hurt to send. Uh, radiation therapy, so especially five to 10 years after radiation therapy, you can start seeing usually the atrophy. So not so much the hyperintensity, but the, the, the thinning of the spinal cord can also happen similarly in those patients that have been treated in the past. And then I add some infectious agents and obviously a lot of the, the patient's history, right? Their, uh, their risk behaviors, like the, all of, a lot of those things or where they come from is going to play a role into, into considering things like uh, like tropical spastic paraparesis with the HDLV1. So if I were to still live in Brazil, that would be very high on differential or tuberculosis, for example, but uh, but not not really not so much in the US. Um, it becomes more like the, the zebra of the zebra. So um, so I talked a little bit about uh, MOG. I really just mentioned that within the transverse myelitis. So what is MOG? Uh, it's not the purpose of the lecture today, but it's a myelin oligodendrocyte uh, antibody uh, related disease. We don't have a better name for it yet because it wasn't described by DAVIC, right? It's much more recent. So we're in the phase of, of calling the disease what it is, what it does in, the, in, in terms of mechanisms of action. But I do want to differentiate because I would say very often when we see those patients, this is our main differential, right? Sometimes people are very likely to, to tune down, this is a primary CNS inflammatory disease. It's got to be excluded, other things. But now, how do we differentiate between those three? So all of all three like women, but neuromyelitis optica likes women the most. It's about a, a, a like a nine to one. Uh, so if you see a man, what I would say, I, was think, I would think less likely of neuromyelitis optica and more likely about either MS or MOG. The age is similar. For MS, very often those patients are going to present a little earlier, but you can really see those patients at any age. Uh, and then for the clinical presentation, if they come in uh, with bilateral optic neuritis, then that has a much higher likelihood. Look at those numbers, 35 to 41% of those patients of being MOG, just because it has a much higher predilection for the optic nerves compared to the other disorders. 
And then the other final thing that I'll point out your attention is what I wrote in, in red all the way down there, which is the location of those lesions. Mog likes the bottom of the spinal cord. Uh, it likes the area that we call the thoracal lumbar. It's those cone lesions. And NMO likes the cervical thoracic or cervical medullary junction. So it likes to be in those junctions that are higher up within the spinal cord and the medulla. But that's not why you're here, right? We're what, halfway through? Yeah, a, a little over. But um, what you're here, what do people really want? Geez, no, it's to talk about the treatment. So you know the acute management of those patients, right? Typically, we're going to hit them hard. If you're thinking of it, even if the alcohol and antibody is not back yet, if I started IV steroids on someone on an inpatient service and they're not responding, then very quickly, I'm going to, go, I'm going to chase that with plasmapheresis. Uh, and that's usually every other day for three to seven sessions. Um, and if you don't start aggressive therapy, uh, and why do we start aggressive therapy? Because very often those patients that look like NMO from the beginning, right? Even if you if that antibody is unknown, right? They can fit criteria of just those core two core clinical characteristics. You we know now, you know after watching the first half of this lecture that they have a poor prognosis, right? That there is a very high chance, sixty percent of a new recurrent attack within the first year, ninety percent that eventually they will have that second one. So usually the treatment, well, in the past, the, the prevention of those relapses really fall within the medications that we use for everything else that is inflammatory, right? Not much different than what you see uh, for, let's say, lupus, for example. So let's talk a little bit about each one of those older medications that we used to use. Uh, so rituximab, still the most common medication that is used for this disorder, still probably the most common one that I use for sure. Uh, so rituximab, uh, it works very well. And as you can see from, uh, from this population here, uh, which is a meta-analysis that was published uh, after uh, reviewing 18 studies, uh, they included 577 patients and about 75% of those patients were acoporin-4 positive, which is true to what we see in clinic. The vast majority of those, about 90%, were women. And you can see here... Uh, to the left of the graph, demonstrating that the vast majority of those places had a very good response to rituximab. Uh, so usually what we're going to see, so what they saw here is the mean difference in the annual relapse rate of minus 1.56% with a very good confidence interval. Uh, so it works very well in the majority of those patients. I would say that about 70% of those patients do have, uh, do have uh, a very good response uh, how about tocilizumab, which is an interleukin-6 antibody? So there were small studies. There were never any large series. Uh, I can tell you that, for example, I did my fellowship in, in, in 2016, and uh, I only used tocilizumab for neuromyelitis optica in one patient that had failed rituximab. So it, it wasn't very popular. Uh, and you can see here those patients in the, the black boxes shows you each one of their relapses. And because it was only seven patients, we can show this for each one of them. And then uh, after they got started on tocilizumab, you can see that very few of those patients, only two, continue to have relapses. And even within those two patients, there is a very low relapse rate. So it works very well, but it does have a few adverse events, such as the increased chances of infections and mostly upper respiratory infections, acute enterocolitis and pyelonephritis were the things that we're seeing in those patients. And I would say probably one of the main reasons for us not to use it that much is that we're not comfortable with it, right? So uh, while in neurology, we're very used to using B-cell therapy with the rituximab, a CD20 uh, antibody. With tocilizumab, the, the interleukin-6, it, it makes most of us a little uncomfortable because it's not something that we use every day. So let's talk about what has changed. So uh, in 2017, this uh, 2017 to 2018, this, this paper was published. Uh, so uh, the PREVENT study was evaluating aculizumab, which is a complement inhibitor, a terminal complement C5 inhibitor, which uh, I'll explain by, well, actually just, just right now. So within the complement path, uh, to, to prevent the MAC formation, what you, uh, what you need is, uh, is, is just a terminus uh, just the terminus uh, C5B. So when you're selecting the C5A part of the complement termination, you're really selecting this to prevent the cascade of inflammation to continue to happen, which is what uh, was engineered for aculizumab, which is this, this particular form of complement in inhibition. Um, 
The PREVENT trial is a randomized, double-blind, two-to-one ratio uh, time-to-event trial, meaning that each patient, um, the patients were not necessarily followed for six months or followed for a year. They were followed until they had that first relapse. And that was the moment. Uh, and what they were really looking was for how long do we need to continue following those patients uh, to see that, that most of those were responding well uh, to this immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, and the annualized re uh, relapse rate for most of those patients was around two. So they were having two, on average, two relapses per year. And what they saw was that only three of 96 patients had relapses while on apilizumab, compared to 43% of those patients within the placebo group, which was a reduction in the annualized relapse rate to 0 0.02 in the apilizumab uh, group, and a very big reduction actually on the placebo group to 0 0.35. And then this drug got approved the following year uh, back in June of 2019. Uh, there's always questions, so I'm going to get ahead of the curve, and I'm going to mention already that, so why, why do you think there was such a decrease in the relapse rate for both groups, right? Because what they did was that they had an adjudication committee. Uh, so if you go to the supplement uh, data within the study, um, you can see the rules that they use for each one of those, which is really involving just the clinical presentation of those patients. And when they, um, when those patients, whenever the, let's say the site PI of a study would say that a patient had a relapse, in order to really consider this a relapse, they had to send to this committee that was usually three neurologists with at least one of those, including a neuro-ophthalmologist that would say if they agreed or not with the clinician that this was a true relapse. So that adjudication committee, that there was actually a lot of discrepancy that they were not considering some of those events a relapse. And then because of that, there was a reduction in both of those groups. But again, they were blinded. So even if that reduction in both groups, you can see the huge discrepancy between both uh, groups. And then here you can see the survival plot of in blue, you can see the line of the aculizumab patients, really most of them staying without relapses throughout the study. And then the vast majority of the patients in the placebo group that had a relapse um, having kind of like dropping out of the curve. Here you can see the differences between uh, the patients that were allowed to continue a concomitant immunosuppressive therapy on the bottom and the ones that did not have any other immunosuppressive therapy on the top. And you can see that really the gap gets even wider on those patients that were not allowed to continue other immunosuppressive therapy, uh, meaning that were on placebo alone, for example. Uh, the safety was actually pretty good. So what are the things that we worry about for patients when we are doing complement inhibition? So mostly those cocci, right? Those encapsulated organisms like meningococcus and gonorrhea. Uh, so uh, the, because we worry so much about those, they actually have to be vaccinated before the, uh, for meningitis, before they actually start this drug, uh, which is sometimes a little tricky, especially when you're transitioning patients out of rituximab, for example, a B-cell therapy that makes it a little harder to respond to a vaccine into this drug. Uh, but the actual data from, uh, from the trial, it, it wasn't as as bad as one would expect. Uh, and this is actually what we're doing, what we're seeing the open label area. Uh, so in the, now, now that the vast majority of those patients have been followed for over four years after the completion of the trial, uh, there has not been uh, a higher number of deaths and there has not been uh, uh, many more complications. So how about inebilizumab? Uh, so that's a, another drug that has been approved just a few months after eclizumab. Uh, so inebilizumab is a CD19 inhibitor. We talk a lot about CD20, right? So the CD20 is really uh, the, the ones that, if you, if you look at this graph of the lymphocytes, the, C, the, the B cells that express CD20 are the ones that are right in the middle. Uh, so they're going everywhere from the pre-B cells all the way to the plasma B cells. Um, to the plasmoblasts, but then the CD19, it's a much wider range of expression. So you're getting all the way from the bone marrow with the pro B cells down to the plasma cells. So you're doing, you're getting more of those cells. Uh, in this trial, what they did that was different from the, from the, from the, uh, on the end momentum, what was different from the PREVENT trial was that they included both patients that were aquaporin for positive or aquaporin for negative. You have to keep in mind that those patients were, 
that those all of those trials actually started before the 2015 change in the criteria. So most of those have actually followed the 26, the 2006 criteria, which basically means that it was harder to include patients, right? That they have had to have no other uh, CNS manifestations. Um, they had to have at least one attack in the prior year or two attacks in the two years before. And what they did was a three to one ratio of receiving the drug versus uh, placebo. And for those patients, uh, what they actually did was that they followed uh, they followed them along uh, for 197 days, and then at that point, everyone would go into the open label extension. So they didn't wait until all of those relapses to happen like in the other trial. And the reasoning behind here is that they really didn't want to keep that many people on the placebo uh, for much longer than it would have been needed. Uh, so the, the, the infusions are actually very similar to what we do with rituximab which is uh, two infusions, and in this case are 300 milligrams separated by two weeks, and then you keep repeating that once every six months. And here you can see the graphs of the overall population on the left, uh, so all the patients that received uh, inebolizumab, and then you can see it on the red line the ones that responded very well uh, versus the ones with placebo that kept kind of in the survival plot dropping out of the curve. And then to the right, I'll call your attention to the aquaporin-4 positive uh, um, uh, patient's graph. So in this second graph, we're excluding the ones that are aquaporin-4 negative. And what I'm mostly going to call your attention is how similar those graphs are. You could almost like superimpose those, right? Uh, I swear to you that they are different graphs. I didn't make a mistake and copy and paste the same graph. Uh, you can pay attention to these numbers. You see that they're a little different. Um, so really what this tells to me is that this is a drug that works well in both groups, right? Both the ones that have aquaporin-4 positive and the ones that have aquaporin-4 negative. Who knows, maybe five or 10 years from now, we're going to start with changes in the criteria, we're going to start trying to exclude more of these people that don't have the antibody. And then this is a drug that because it's a B-cell therapy, the way that I think about this if you made a mistake and someone is aquaporin-4 negative and you think that they still have NMO, this is a drug that would potentially treat someone that has multiple sclerosis as well, for example. Uh, so, so I like this a lot. Uh, I will mention that uh, all, you, would be, you would be off-label use if you were to be using this for someone that is aquaporin-4 negative. And for the purposes of this lecture, really the FDA has approved only uh, the use of enabolizumab for only aquaporin-4 positive uh, patients. And this is because they didn't power the study. There weren't enough patients that were aquaporin-4 negative to get that FDA approval. And then in terms of safety, again, it wasn't too bad. Arthralgias, uh, lower respiratory infections, and itchiness were most of the things that we're seeing. There were two deaths. Uh, and the that, that happened within uh, within the open, open label phase of the trial, but we have not been seeing this in real life. Uh, one of them was related to a severe attack, which we can see in, in, in neuromyelitis optica, and one of them had a new brain lesion of unclear etiology. Uh, and I was told that this patient was tested negative for JC virus, and also this was right after that this patient had started this drug. And then the final one is satralizumab, um, which again, got they, they all got their approval very close together between 2019 and 2020. So satralizumab is very similar to tocilizumab, but instead of being chimeric, it's a humanized anti-interleukin-6 antibody. Uh, and the, here's the proposed mechanism of the disease. So the way, the easiest way to think about this, I know it looks very complicated, is that interleukin-6 is a pro-inflammatory type of cytokine. So when you're inhibiting that, you're decreasing a whole lot of other things, such as complement activation, you're decreasing... Uh, uh, the ability of recruitment for uh, for uh, from antigen presenting cells, and then because of that, you decrease inflammation in general. Uh, so there were two pivotal trials, and for the purpose of, of this lecture, I'm mostly going to talk about the Secure Sky, uh, which involved patients uh, from 12 all the way to 74 years old. So this this actually got this is the only one that got a, a population that was a little younger, so not just 18 and above. Again, included patients that were both seropositive for aquaporin 4 and zero negative. And then the one major difference from this uh, compared to the other uh, medications is that it's a subcutaneous injection. So this one is not an infusion. Uh, so they compared satralizumab versus placebo. The population is very similar to the one in the other trials. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to focus on that. And what they saw here was a, a fairly similar survival plot compared to the other ones. I will say that the, the, 
the, the, what does call my attention is the responses right in the beginning. And you can see that there's a little bit of a drop right in the beginning of the curve, which tells me that it takes a little while for this drug to actually start doing its job, right? And sometimes I worry about that in patients that have such a higher chance, uh, chance of having a second attack. So it wouldn't mean that I'm not, I don't use this drug. It would just mean that I would use it with caution. Uh, so what I would probably do is similar to what we do in rituximab, which is we usually do a bridge with steroids. So for those patients, what I would probably do if I'm starting someone on cetralizumab is I would continue a bridge of a very slow taper of steroids right in the beginning uh, to, to help bridge that gap until I'm assuming that this drug is going to start acting, is going to start doing the job that it's supposed to do. And then I'm going to throw in another graph here, which is so on the top is the overall population. And then on the bottom, you can see the ones on the left, the ones that are seropositive versus on the right, the ones that are seronegative. So the, 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 the graph on the top and the one on the left are very similar, right? So the data from the overall population was mostly driven, that those good results were mostly driven by the ones that are alcoporin-4 positive. And the, the really, that wasn't that much of a statistical significance uh, for, for prevention of attacks in the alcoporin-4 negative uh, patients, meaning that this drug is really truly meant to be used in those alcohol for positive and, and they will likely never be pursuing approval for the ones that are alcohol for negative. And the safety again, very similar uh, with, uh, within this, this drug, it was the only one there was actually no deaths reported so far. And then in the interest of time, because I do wanna give you guys some time for questions and I see that there's, there's already something on the chat, I am going to skip this last case. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for joining this morning. Uh, super happy to, to have talked to you guys. Well, what questions doctor, we all have. Dr. Tony, it was excellent, excellent talk because I think there, with a the neuroimmunology overall, uh, it's still, I think in many people's head, MS and NMO are sort of, you know, like sitting in the same, you know, on the same couch, but in reality, I mean, those are even pathogenetically are totally different diseases. One is astrocytes, another more is a language. Critical. I mean, everything mixes in, but it's, it's such a distinct, such a, and, you know, it's interesting that, um, sort of MS is a little bit older disease, but we still probably understand it less than what we understand about NMO. Absolutely. <laughs> he hasn't had that holy grail moment yet, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. I see multiple sclerosis as this most likely like bundle of several disorders and we treat all of them similarly, but it, it just, it's just so heterogeneous, right? And uh, yeah, we don't have an antibody, so we know less about it. So we do have some questions for you. Um, yes. The, the vulnerable areas uh, in the NMO spectrum disorders. You mentioned that you know there, they, they, it is the propensity of the lesions are you know where where there is a cerebrospinal spinal fluid you know that around the ventricles, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think determines that? Is just it's more uh, receptors there, the blood something about the blood brain barrier there, or what determines you know why are these areas so selective? The density of the receptors. So all of those areas, if you look like surrounding the spinal canal and surrounding the optic nerves. Uh, and especially the optic nerves, because they are completely surrounded by CSF. Uh, those are the areas that have a much higher density of those aquaporin-4 channels. Uh, so at least in this disorder, now knowing, right, since 2004, that there is the aquaporin-4 antibody, we then went on to understand in autopsies of those patients that those are the areas that, that do have the higher density. Do you, what is your personal opinion? Do you think aquaporin negative? disease is the same disease? Right. Uh, I, I think depending depending on uh, on where you go, uh, there is a, a higher chance or a lower chance uh, in, in the country or in the world, right? So like depending on the center, if you if you have like a neuroimmunology trained specialist, there's there's a higher chance that you will not be diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica if you don't have the alcohol for antibody. Uh, so it's 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 center dependent and and I will say that um, I think very carefully uh, to before I go ahead and diagnose someone with neuromyelitis optica that is antibody negative. With that being said, usually when there's that uncertainty, uh, so one the, the the three drugs that are more recently approved by the FDA they are not approved for uh, antibody negative patients. So usually my go to would be rituximab. Uh, so it, uh, in my mind is if this person doesn't have neuromyelitis optica, usually the biggest other one on the differential for me is multiple sclerosis. So I just go to something that can treat both. Uh, okay. 
And then I, I continue to think of them as NMOSD versus multiple sclerosis okay. without putting my foot down. Yeah. Now, when there is a, you mentioned that these patients frequently have coexistence with some other autoimmune disorders like SLE, myasthenia, et cetera. And I think that becomes a pickle one, you know, when you have an MO, but probably negative, and then you have SLE, would you still lean calling them NMOs and treat as NMO or more as SLE autoimmune disorder? <laughs> I, oh my goodness. Absolutely. I, I have one of those cases, uh, a woman that I, that one, I am a hundred percent convinced that she has neuromyelitis optica. And because of that, I treat her with rituximab and rituximab doesn't treat lupus or is not the top preference of the rheumatologist. So she, this in particular is a case of a woman that is now, an, unfortunately, a combination of dual immunosuppression of cell sept as well for lupus. But yeah, with lupus is especially tricky. But if someone has, um, you know, something that looks just like neuromyelitis optica and they have lupus, then it, regardless of what we call it, it's inflammatory, right? Regardless if it's coming from directly an aquaporin for antibody, which would definitely make my life easier versus just, you know, uh, like CNS inflammation and sometimes like an inflammatory storm, right? Of like at the same time, they have multi-organ involvement, including the brain. Then then, then it, in, in practical terms, it ends up not making that much of a difference if I'm going to call this CNS lupus versus NMOSD antibody negative because the drugs that I would use would treat both. And very often my go-to is the rituximab, like thinking of the NMOSD part versus, uh, versus uh, and then adding something else that might be better for lupus. If they do have, uh, if they do have uh, the antibody positive, then, then I would probably go for one of the three more recently approved and then probably would go to, to interleukin-6 because then I'm thinking of trying to get lupus treated for that as well. So that's uh, actually a good segue to the next question, the treatment. How do you choose the treatment? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's... it's um, so, so I think similarly, the, when, when I was a resident, I had attendings that like, how, so how, like, how, how, that would ask me like, or, or I would watch them, how do you make a choice of like for migraine prophylaxis, right? You got to become comfortable with ideally all of them. So I did, so, you know, because I am a neuroimmunologist and I end up seeing more of those patients, I have the opportunity of trying through the three of those drugs. But um, again, to become comfortable and knowing how to manage what's going to happen. But in terms of the patient preference, usually there's something that will help me. Example, ecolizumab, if you remember those, like those first graphs that I showed you, uh, that I showed, and let me just go back to, to sharing my screen. There. Um, so for ecolizumab, you just have such a steep curve of, of not like a, a flat curve, I'm sorry, of those patients not dropping right in the beginning that I would say if I'm seeing a patient that has now had, let's say, two relapses back to back before they even got to me. So in November, they got admitted with transverse myelitis. And then in like February, they got, uh, they got optic neuritis. I want to start them on something that is going to work as fast as it can. So I'm going to try if they are treatment naive, right? If, if I don't have a problem of switching from rituximab to this drug, then my go-to would probably be aculizumab. If someone has myasthenia grave, as aculizumab is a drug that is also approved for that. So that also makes my life easier, right? Like trying to minimize the amount of immunosuppression that they're going to get and trying to condense things into one. If they have been on rituximab before, it's a little tricky because I lose time with trying to check the antibodies for vaccinations, right? I have to vaccine them to give them a vaccine for meningitis. And then two to four weeks later, I have to check if those antibodies are there. No one's got time for that, especially in those patients that are, you know, actively relapsing. So usually for that, that would actually dissuade me from this drug. Um, and then if, if they're treatment naive and uh, they don't have a comorbid, uh, disorder, then then one of my favorites is inabilizumab, is is the, the CD19 inhibitor, which is, you know, just just being honest with, with my own faults, similar to the all other neurologists. I, I know what to do with this, right? I've used rituximab so many times 
that there's not that many differences. There's probably in a theoretical increased chances of infections because you're you're getting a wider range of the B cells, but it's not that it, it's not uncomfortable. So so this is probably the one that I use most often. And uh, and then in those other particular situations, the satralizumab in combination with lupus and the and the aclizumab in combination with myasthenia. That would probably those are probably my goals too. How long do you treat NMO? And is there a difference we you know uh, in elder population pediatrics? Such 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 a good question. So there's there's case reports of people that have had um, thirty years apart between two relapses. Uh, so so currently I treat NMO forever. So we're very conservative and you start people on one of those immunosuppressions. I, I can't say if they're going to stay on the same drug forever, but they're going to be on some kind of immunosuppression for a very, very long time until we understand a little better how to maybe do something that will prevent them from even, you know, having a mechanism of having that second relapse, but a second attack, but, but currently forever. And uh, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Yeah. Uh, after excluding other causes, how can you improve confidence of diagnosis in aquaforin for negative patients? Right. Uh, it, it's it's for for it's it becomes more important when you're not thinking so much of a primary CNS inflammatory disorder, right? So if you're thinking of sarcoidosis, for so example, in most of those patients, especially the ones that don't have an aquaporin for positive, I'm going to do other studies mostly to feel comfortable that there's nothing else that I'm missing. So I'll do a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to look for any other systemic source of inflammation, or who knows, maybe malignancy, right? So if there's a lymph node, if there's something uh, that, that is amenable to biopsying, then I'm usually gonna, gonna try to get a biopsy. If, if it looks like cancer at all, if I have any kind of suspicions that this could be a CNS lymphoma, for example, especially on those lesions that are kind of like, you know, disseminating within the, 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 either the diencephalum or, or the encephalum. Like for those ones, I would most certainly get a large volume tap with cytology uh, and in spectroscopy uh, as well to, to try to differentiate inflammatory versus, uh, versus uh, malignant. Uh, and sometimes I still like with those things that increase my confidence interval, but again, I still very often don't put my foot down. Right. So, uh, I have not so much of NMO, but I do have, for example, one patient that I continue to think is this, uh, is this multiple sclerosis versus neurosarcoidosis on someone that has a history of systemic sarcoid, right? Because rarely this happens, but sometimes they can have concomitant disorders. So uh, those are the things that I do, mostly systemic studies. Dr. Thone, thank you very much. It was a great talk. And I, even I'm getting in the in, in the chat, you know, wonderful presentation. Thank you, et cetera, et cetera. So oh, I mean, thank it, you. Definitely. And we do have students and trainees here. So I, 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 I think it was a great also just to clarify, you know, the difference between these uh, inflammatory conditions. It was great seeing you again. Full disclosure, we were we were colleagues with Dr. Thon at some point. Uh, yeah. And uh, um, I would like to thank everybody for joining and uh, uh, looking forward uh, for another Grand Rounds in two weeks again. Thank you very much, everybody. Very nice to see you. Bye. Thank you for having me.